Hey friends, thanks for joining. Welcome to Breville's Masterclass for how to dial in the Barista Express Impress. I'm Matt Davis, product expert for Coffee with Breville. If you're tuning in for the live chat, feel free to ask questions throughout the class. We have a team of experts from Breville that are ready to answer your questions. If you're watching the on-demand version, feel free to email your questions to brevillebarista at brevillusa.com. I'm so excited to be here. Let's make some coffee. Now, here we have the Barista Express Impress, one of our newest machines and newest to the family of the Barista series. Now, today's class is really gonna focus on how to approach the machine and how do we make the coffee that we're using taste the best that it possibly can. That includes troubleshooting and how to make subtle changes if we're unhappy with the outcome. First things first, we need to get some fresh coffee. Now, when it comes to coffee, preference is key. Now, however you like your coffee, I want you to stick with it. However, keep an open mind. All coffee is different, and the way it works inside of a machine is going to vary a lot depending on how dark it's roasted and how fresh it is. So today I am using whole bean coffee that had a roast date. Now, when you're shopping for coffee, you'll probably notice that some bags will have a date that you should use it by, maybe even that it expires. What we really want to look for is a coffee bag that has a roasted date so that we actually know when the coffee was roasted. That's gonna be key for being able to understand how old it is. Now, the closer it is to the roast date, the more CO2 it's gonna have. When it comes to espresso in particular, that CO2 is really important because CO2 carries a lot of the really important aromatic compounds it really ensures a really nice even extraction throughout the whole process. So if I'm using coffee that was roasted three to six months ago, a lot of that goodness has already just vol through volatility gone away. So if you can find coffee that was roasted within 30 days, that's kind of the sweet spot. Now, the coffee I'm using today, kind of a medium roast. If you're using something more on the light or darker side, just know that it might respond a little bit differently. When using espresso, I like to use anything on the medium to darker side of things just because it makes it a little bit easier for the water to access. Just think in terms of when you're roasting, the longer you roast it, the easier it is for water to access it because it's becoming more brittle. Uh, another way to think about it is solubility. The coffee will simply dissolve easier into water the longer it's been roasted. So enough about that. We have our coffee try different coffees, play around with it, have fun with making coffee, that's what's most important. Now let's talk about the machine itself. Now, when you unbox your machine, you'll probably notice a lot of doodads, a lot of accessories, and you're probably trying to understand what they're for and how you use them. So let's quickly just understand that. First things first, all of our machines have a really tidy accessories bin to keep it all really organized. So when you remove your drip tray, you'll be able to access all of those accessories really easily. I wanna focus on these, the different baskets. The rest of them, we're gonna tuck away for later use. Okay, so the razor, we're going to address in just a second. It's a really important part of the dialing in process. But before we get there, a lot of people get hooked on, what are these for? What do I use and when do I change it? Well. It depends on your situation. If you're using whole bean, freshly roasted coffee, I like to use what we call the single wall basket. Now, the way to identify that is if you look inside, you'll see all these tiny holes, and then if you flip it to the bottom, you'll still see all those little holes. The opposite of that would be a very similarly looking basket where still have all the holes on the inside, but on the back, you'll see an extra little wall. Now, this is called the dual wall basket or a pressurized basket. The purpose of this is it's going to engineer back pressure. What I mean by that is when we're brewing espresso, we're putting coffee in the basket 
and then we're forcing water through a pump through those coffee grinds. It's our job to ensure that that water passes through evenly and we hold back the water long enough for the water to extract all the coffee. If the water is able to pass through too quickly, we'll get under extracted coffee. So if you're using coffee that was either pre-ground or not very fresh, this is a great tool to help hold back that water just a little bit longer. For today, we're using the single wall. I got freshly roasted coffee, and I wanna be able to pull out all the intricate flavors inside that coffee. Just know that the pressurized basket is a great tool, even if you're just getting started, to get a better shot a little bit more quickly. I can tuck those away for now because I'm not gonna use them. Two other things that I would love for you to think about including in your workflow. A knock box, maybe a scale, helps with consistency, not mandatory, but what I really like to put focus on is two washcloths. Now, these could be bar towels, kitchen towels. I'm using microfiber, and I have one that's gonna stay dry that I focus on using for cleaning out my portafilter, so it's dry. And then the other one's gonna be slightly damp, and I'm gonna keep that just for my steam wand. So we'll use that later. Having these types of tools really helps with my workflow so that when I approach my machine, I'm able to get exactly what I want, keep it really nice and clean, and walk away, and I don't feel like it was a really cumbersome workflow. Okay, we have that out of the way. Now let's talk about actually making coffee. So we have our portafilter. We're going to do what we call puck preparation. So we're going to get coffee into the basket, ensure it's the right grind size, the right amount of coffee, otherwise known as dose. Think about it as your recipe. How much coffee? How much water? And then we're going to ensure that it's tamped or compressed down before we can actually brew it. And I'll talk you through the whole way. So we're going to put our portafilter into this cradle. And for today's demo, I'm actually going to remove this cover so that we can see what's happening. Now, we could easily leave this on. It's just an aesthetic cover plate to make it look really nice but it also gives you lots of insights to what's happening and makes it really easy to clean. So as soon as the portafilter goes into the cradle, you'll notice on our interface a lot of instruction to support the workflow. So it makes it a lot easier to remember. So as soon as the machine knows that my portafilter is in, you'll notice the first button illuminates, our dose. So dose simply means putting the coffee into the portafilter so we can go ahead and do that now. Okay, so the way that the dose works on the grinder is simply through a timed mechanism. So the machine knows to grind the coffee for a set amount of time, which then dictates how much coffee ends up in the portafilter. So let's say by default, it runs for 14 seconds. Well, the machine doesn't know what type of coffee I'm using because that's gonna change how easily it's ground so what we need to do is calibrate to make sure that we have the right amount of coffee in that portafilter. This is the greatest thing about this machine is it's now telling me to tamp. And what's gonna happen is as I tamp by pulling down on this lever, the machine is also able to sense the depth of the coffee bed telling me if I have the right amount of coffee. Now you'll notice that on my first go, I got the perfect dose with that green light next to the smiley face makes me feel great. <laughs> Nothing like positive affirmation on that. Now, however, if it was not on the green light, let's say it was a little bit under, the dose button would then start blinking. That would tell me that I need to add a little bit more coffee. And what would then happen is the machine would actually correct itself and remember it for next time. Now, I've ground my coffee. I'm on grind setting seven. So what we're going to do is move our port filter over to the group head. This is just simply where hot water is dispersed out of what looks like a shower screen. And we're going to choose either our one cup or two cup button. Now, 
here's something I want you to understand. There is no real difference when it comes to using the one to two cup button in correlation to a single or double basket, right? So we have different baskets that allow different amounts of coffee, but all that changes is how much water passes through that given amount of coffee. Now I'm using the double basket, so you would think that I would need to use the two cup button, which that's what I'm going to do. However, if you want a cup of coffee that's either smaller in volume or just more concentrated in flavor, you could use the one cup button. It's completely up to you. We're using the double basket, so we're going to use the two cup button just to keep that recipe the same. I'm going to grab a shot glass because I have some volumetric measurements here to help me see uh, the actual output. And what I'm going to do is push the two cup button and I'm going to check the time of how long it takes that water to pass through that puck of coffee. Because this machine is a volumetric machine. And what that means is that it's going to automatically stop when a given amount of water passes through the machine. So this one is programmed from the factory to give about two ounces of water. So I'm going to push this button and then I can check to see how long it takes for that volume to pass through the coffee. Okay, now we can see that the coffee is looking pretty delicious, but if you look on the pressure gauge, it's a little shy of the actual espresso range. And all that means is that we're not quite providing enough resistance, that back pressure that we were talking about, right? So our responsibility as the barista in this situation is to adjust our grind setting so that the coffee particles are small enough to hold back the water a little bit longer. So for reference, we want the water or the coffee to start dripping around 10 seconds. And that starts as soon as you push the button. Right, so as soon as the water starts coming into contact with the coffee, we wanna see the first drops around 10 seconds, and then we want the final beverage to finish anywhere between 22 to 37 seconds. Now, it's a big range because it completely depends on what kind of coffee you're using. Something to look for is when the first bit of coffee starts dripping out, you don't want the actual fluid to look really erratic. You don't want it moving back and forth a lot. You want it to look really consistent and kind of imagine what warm honey would look like dripping out of those spouts. Regardless of what comes out of your machine, I highly encourage you to taste it regardless because it's really helpful to understand the coffee you're using and the machine to become a better barista just by understanding what a good or bad shot of espresso tastes like. Now, by no means was that a bad shot of espresso, but it wasn't exactly what I want. So I'm actually going to knock out this puck. Should come out pretty easily. Wash my porta filter, making sure it's nice and dry and clean. And then I'm gonna go back and repeat the exact same process. So again, step one is to put it into the cradle. However, this time I'm going to change my grind setting. We don't wanna do a lot of clicks at a time because then we could end up chasing our tail. I encourage anywhere between two to three clicks of a grind adjustment at a time. So we went from seven to five. Now we can just repeat that same process with our dose. As you'll notice, the lights are again illuminating, showing me what I need to do so we're ready to tamp. Now, because I made that grind adjustment, less coffee is coming through in the same amount of time, so we actually need to calibrate our dose. So you'll notice these lights are now telling me I don't have enough coffee, so the machine is telling me I need to add a bit more. So by hitting the dose button again, I'll add just a little bit more coffee. And we'll do this probably a few times until we get right where we need to be. 
So you'll notice we're just almost there. So the way it works is you'll dose, tamp, dose, tamp, back and forth. And each time you tamp, that's allowing the machine to register the new change. And as soon as you hit the green light, that machine will then remember whatever time adjustments it made so it'll hit the dose perfectly the next time. So we are perfectly tamped, distributed, dosed, ready to go. We can put it back into the group head. And again, hit that two cup button. You would then want to start a timer, whether you're using a separate stopwatch or your phone as just a helpful tool here. Paying attention to our pressure gauge, now we're getting the perfect amount of back pressure. Our streams are looking like warm honey. They're not flowing back and forth a whole lot. This shot looks perfect. All right. So now we're well within that frame of reference that we wanted. We have a shot that looks a little bit more concentrated. It's going to have a lot more flavor to it. Uh, it's also going to have more body, meaning like the thickness or the consistency that you actually feel in your mouth, uh, which is going to go a long way if you're adding something like hot water, milk, or anything. It's going to support the flavor of coffee throughout. So now I can taste the difference. Oh, so much better. So when you're brewing coffee of any type, they kind of extract in layers, right? So the first bit of coffee you're pulling out is a lot of the sour components. Then you start getting into the really sweet stuff and then you top it out with the bitter components. So you really want like a perfect balance of all three. And when you get the extraction right, you're gonna taste it. You're not gonna end up with that like papery mouthfeel afterwards. It's just gonna be pleasant. It's gonna make you want to go back for more versus wanting to chase it with something different. <laughs> But again, every coffee will taste different. Try to find that sweet spot. These are just really helpful parameters to get started. I would now call this machine dialed in. So we are now done with the coffee portion, which is exciting. Uh, and now we can focus on the milk side of things. So I'm just going to take these cups, put them away, and I'm going to switch to a larger vessel and we're going to talk about milk. Now, before I do that, I am going to pull one more shot of espresso just to use as the base of this beverage. Now, what's really great about espresso is once you pull a good shot, you're now, you now have the basis of pretty much every beverage you can imagine, whether it's a cappuccino, latte, an iced latte, anything. Um, so really spend time getting the shot just right and then really just have fun with it afterwards. So same process. Now we can tamp. And as you'll notice, because I calibrated it last time, it got the dose the first time. Now I can go ahead and brew this into a slightly larger cup. Now technically I could reuse the shot that I pulled a second ago, but let's start fresh. Now while that's brewing, let's start talking about milk. For today, I'm going to be using whole milk. Now you can use whatever milk you want. And in fact, I also have some oat milk, which I'm a really big fan of. Whole milk works really well just because it's kind of the perfect balance of fat and protein and everything else involved. The most important aspect of steaming milk comes to the ability for the milk to hold up to heat and holding the air that you put into it. Because what we're doing is we're trying to find this perfect balance of relaxing all the proteins in the milk and then allowing them to create new forms around the air bubbles that we put into it. It sounds complicated, and technically it is, but you don't need to focus on all that crazy science. We're just gonna teach you some of the basic techniques that you need to understand in order 
to really create some delicious, what we re refer to as micro foam, so that the bubbles hold their consistency and texture. And if you're wanting to get creative, you can pour some latte art. But at the end of the day, it's all about how the beverage feels when you sip on it, so that drinking experience. So I'm gonna go ahead and knock out this puck so that we can get the portafilter out of the way, create as much room as possible. I'm just gonna move the machine real quick. Okay, now we went over the coffee side of things, cleaning as we go, and you'll notice I made almost no mess thanks to the impress puck system. Now we're going to switch to our other rag that I mentioned earlier. So this one's gonna be slightly damp. I like to just use the shower head for the actual espresso to just slightly make this rag damp. You don't want it to be soaking wet, just wet enough so that it can easily clean the steam wand as soon <laughs> as we're done steaming. Really important. Now, I have this steam jug full to just below the spout, and you can see that from the inside uh, marking. So just slightly below the bottom of the steam spout for the pitcher, uh, and you can kind of play around with how much milk goes into it depending on what vessel you'll be pouring into. So now that we have our whole milk, and again, you can use whatever milk you would like to or need to use. This, the technique of how we create this foam will be pretty much the same. You'll just need to kind of tweak a few little things back, back and forth, especially if you're going from whole milk to an alternative. If you're only choosing one ingredient, once you figure it out, you'll be set. Okay, so first things first is positioning the steam wand. Uh, this will be really, really important. So think about how you have your home bar set up and think about the ergonomics of how you can repeat this process over and over and over again really easily. So get creative about where your steam wand goes, how you're holding your steam wand and where your body is positioned in front of your machine. Do what feels comfortable because you need to repeat it every time. Okay, what I like to do is to bring my steam wand up to a 45 degree position, which for this machine is all the way up. And then I like to bring it out just a little bit. But because I'm on this side of the machine, I'm gonna bring it this way. Just know that there's some flexibility in that positioning, as long as you have it all the way up, because that's gonna make sure that the steam wand isn't moving once you put the jug in there. I like to anchor it as high up as it can go. And then I like to use the spout of the steam pitcher to create kind of an anchor point so that I can pivot instead of having to freely hold the, the jug up against the steam wand, okay? So there's two positions we need to be mindful of. One is the depth of how far in the steam wand is into the milk, and the other is from a bird's eye view where the steam tip is inside of the jug. So let's work on both. From a bird's eye view, we want to kind of envision that this jug is divided into four quadrants because we never want the steam tip to be right in the middle. We want it to be slightly offset just a little bit and then towards the front. So you'll notice that I can put my jug perfectly vertical and then tilt it back and then to the side. And what that does is it allows me to get the tip of the steam wand to be just below the surface of the milk. This is really important because the first thing we're going to do is try to create a whirlpool. So you wanna be off center, and then you want the steam tip to slowly break the surface of the milk so that you can start to inject air. So let's go ahead and work through it, and I'll talk about it as we go. Now, before we actually get started, it's really important to try to purge as much water that might be in the system as possible. So if you look on the side of your machine, you have two different options. One is going to be for shifting over to hot water, let's say for an Americano, and then the other is going to be shifting to steam. So we're going to shift it over to the steam position, and it's going to take the machine just a few seconds to go from our brew temperature to our steam temp. So we're brewing coffee at about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, but to get to steam, we need to jump all the way up to 270 degrees Fahrenheit. Perfect. Once we see steam, we know we're good to go. We can turn it off, 
Now we can focus on our positioning. So getting the jug right where we need it. So again, we are slightly off centered and we can turn on our steam. Wait for it to build up pressure. And what we want to do, once it starts really going, slowly push pulling down on our jug so that it breaks the surface of the milk. It kind of sounds like paper tearing. This is what's called aeration. We want to do this until the jug feels like it's about body temperature. So just keep spinning that milk, tearing that paper until the jug feels like it's just starting to get warm. And then we can submerge the tip so that you no longer break the surface. And that my friends is it. We just want to go from position A to position B. Either you're introducing air or you're not. Once the bottom of the jug feels like it's too hot for your fingers or your hand, it is too hot for you to drink most likely. So then you can just turn it off and now we are good to go. As soon as we're done steaming, we're going to wipe that steam wand thoroughly and then we're going to give it one more purge to make sure no milk is stuck back up inside the steam wand. And that's it. That's the process. So we now have our milk and I'm going to tap it a few times to break any surface bubbles and then give it a really good swirl to make sure that I'm reincorporating any bubbles and foam that I created so that the foam is all throughout the volume of the milk instead of just sitting on top. Once that's done, I can then tilt my cup just slightly and start pouring. Now don't overthink this process. But if the texture of your milk is just right, latte art is just an inherent byproduct of the foam meeting the solution and density of the coffee. So I start from a slightly high angle and then I just slowly get really close so that the foam goes to the surface. And that would be a latte. There you have it. So I want you to really just have fun with the process of making the coffee, learning how to get the foam just right, and then know that the latte art will just come with time. At one point, it was an accident. <laughs> so if you get your density and your foam just right, you'll end up with something similar, and then you can start practicing that technique over and over again. Think about changing the amount of milk that you add to your coffee to change that ratio, and that will then change the strength of your beverage. Now, once you have all that done, don't forget, clean as you go. Take care of your machine, it will take care of you. Otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you out there. Have a good one.